Welcome and thank you for joining us for our Zoom conference on commutations in Michigan. Everyone at Safe and Just Michigan is thrilled that you're participating. We've muted your microphones to ensure that everyone can hear the panel, but please ask any questions you have using the chat function on Zoom. You'll find chat on the taskbar when you hover your mouse over the bottom of the screen. For anyone who's not used Zoom before, the chat button is the one that looks like a talk balloon. At the end of every panel, we will gather up and answer questions for as long as time allows. We'll be putting links to an exit survey and ways to get in contact with Safe and Just Michigan on the screen at the end of the panel discussion. But you'll also be able to find those links during the event in the chat room. We wanna thank our co-sponsor, the American Friends Service Committee Michigan Criminal Justice Program for helping us with all parts of this event. For those of you who wanna revisit this discussion, we are streaming this event on Safe and Just Michigan's Facebook page through Facebook Live and will be put up it will be put up on the Safe and Just Michigan YouTube channel later today. You can also engage with us on social media or by using our website. Thank you for joining us. John? I want to thank everyone for joining us today. We're really excited to talk about commutations. Um, this is an issue we've been uh, interested in for a long time. Um, but we think it's especially timely in the midst of uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. First, as many of you know, I think there's a, a large outbreak in Michigan's prison system. Um, there's over 450 confirmed prisoner cases. Um, over 100, I think there's 175 confirmed staff cases, which makes it, I believe, the largest outbreak in any state prison system in the country. Um, it's, I think, especially concerning from our perspective for a couple reasons. Um, first, uh, Michigan has, by some measures, the oldest prison population in the country. The average age um, in our prison population is almost 40. Um, almost a quarter of prisoners are over 50. And one of the facilities with the largest outbreaks is where many of Michigan's geriatric prisoners are housed. That's the Lakeland facility in Coldwater. Um, uh, about half of the people housed there are over 50. So that's, that's a major concern for us. And um, because of the way our sentencing and parole laws work, over 85% of the people who are in prison in Michigan are not um, currently eligible for parole and therefore MDOC has no authority to release them, which means the governor's office um, is really the only um, legal means for these vulnerable people to be um, released from prison. Um, and the primary tool um, out there for governors to work on is, is the topic um, we've selected today. Um, uh, commutations are rarely granted in Michigan, and we'll talk more about that later, but uh, the governor does have the authority to reduce a person's sentence and make them eligible for parole. Uh, the governor has ability to do a few other things that we'll talk about later, um, but ultimately um, the bottom line is that executive action is needed to reach the vast majority of vulnerable people in Michigan's prison system to protect them from the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, I want to introduce our panel now. We have a very distinguished panel. Um, first, we have Mark Osler, who's a former federal prosecutor He's the Robert and Marion Short Professor of Law at the St. Thomas School of Law in Minnesota. And he's, um, for a number of years, been one of the leading experts on commutation policy, both federal and state. Uh, we're delighted to have him with us today. Um, joining Mark is Paul Reingold, who is a longtime director of litigation clinic at the University of Michigan Law School, has a deep knowledge and experience with criminal law and commutations. Um, and Finally, we have Demetrius Titus, who uh, is a friend of ours from AFSC and um, notably has actually navigated the commutation process himself. And we're really excited to hear from Demetrius about um, what that was like um, and ways in which the, the process could work better. Um, so to kick it off, I'm gonna go um, first to Mark. Um, so big picture, you know, we use the term clemency as an umbrella term to talk about a number of different executive powers 
Uh, could you talk a little bit, Mark, about what the different executive powers are and how they work? Sure. The, um, yeah, the, when we talk about clemency, as you mentioned, it can mean a lot of different things. Uh, often we hear about pardons and pardons affect the conviction itself, the underlying conviction. Uh, the, the Michigan Supreme Court has said that it makes it as if the conviction never occurred. Um, we see pardons happening sometimes long after the person has completed their sentence, but also under most jurisdictions, it's possible to have a pardon um, even before a person is sentenced. And in the case of Richard Nixon, President Ford gave him a pardon before he was even charged. Um, and so the pardon is the one with the most far reaching effects. Next, commutations serve, they don't affect the underlying conviction. What they do is shorten a sentence or amend a sentence in some way, um, get rid of a period of supervised release. But most commonly, it's going to shorten the period of incarceration. What we saw under President Obama and his clemency initiative was mostly commutations, over 1,700 of them. And finally, reprieves are something that's relevant, not often done, but is relevant to what's being talked about now. A reprieve is hitting the pause button on a sentence where somebody will be allowed to uh, not serve the sentence and then um, be expected to, to come back. We often hear about reprieves in terms of capital punishment in those states that have capital punishment where the execution is put off by reprieve. Yeah, and, and all of these different kinds of clemency have been under discussion within the sort of conversation about how should governors manage their prison system uh, in the midst of a pandemic. And um, I believe um, some states have done reprieves. I think I saw something from Pennsylvania. Yes, yes, we've seen, we've seen reprieves happening. And uh, I think we've also seen commutations from several states. Yeah, one of the more significant ones was in Oklahoma that, you know, within the last week, we saw 450 sentences commuted specifically because of the threat of COVID-19. Um, from your perspective, uh, what are the strengths and weaknesses of each of these methods within the context of the pandemic? Well, pardons probably we're not going to see much of because that's uh, more extensive than necessary to, to, to meet what the need is right now. So principally, we're talking about commutations and reprieves. Now, a commutation is going to allow someone to uh, leave prison and you know, serve the, the rest of their term on depending on the jurisdiction, parole, supervised release, home confinement, sometimes not under supervision at all. Um, and then we've got reprieves that are being considered by some places. One advantage that a commutation is going to have in cases where it's deemed appropriate over a reprieve is that when a reprieve is, is given, usually there's an end date for it. And because we don't know the timeline on this pandemic, uh, it, it's pretty risky to set a end date. Um, now you could have an open-ended reprieve, but then you're gonna have to go back and revisit all of those. And I think that's why we're seeing some governors, for example, in Oklahoma, favor commutations. And I think that's appropriate. Very good. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the logistics of reprieves are challenging, right? Because, you know, you need to find people and monitor and bring them back ultimately when, when the emergency is over. And the, the logistics of that strike me as being complicated. It's, it's complicated. And another thing that, that we see is in a situation like that is often it shows that there's really not a need to bring the person back. Uh, you consider the case of Matthew Charles, for example, um, who was freed. It was ruled to be an error, but he'd established a track record in freedom of being a responsible uh, citizen. And so, um, you know, that, that's something that we would probably see with reprieves as well. So taking a step back, you know, this, this idea that the executive, whether um, a governor or the president, has, should have the authority to reduce or eliminate a criminal conviction, this is not a new idea. And it's also a very widely accepted idea. Uh, can you talk a bit about the historical background of, of the idea of clemency, how it came to the U.S., and how widely accepted it is here? <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, historically, it is truly ancient. It goes back to the Code of Hammurabi. So uh, this is nothing new. In fact, one of one of the things that I carry around in my pocket is is this tiny coin that's 1,700 years old. It's a is minted in Antioch, and it bears the name of the Roman goddess of clemency, Clemencia, uh, and is uh, so it's something that that truly is ancient. Of course, it comes to us from the British tradition where uh, kings had that power. Clemency is in the Magna Carta, for example. Uh, now, it was controversial because it was a power of kings to put it in the Constitution, but they did. And, you know, just to use one historical example to show how it is used in times of crisis, uh, that George Washington was the first person to use it. And the way he used it was really telling. You had the Whiskey Rebellion that people in Western Pennsylvania uh, didn't want to, they wanted to be able to pay their taxes or were being taxed for, for whiskey, which they produced, which they could get to market more easily. And so they, they rebelled. They tarred and feathered a tax collector. Um, they declared themselves independent. Uh, interestingly, these are my people. Um, they come from those counties. So, uh, and Washington, um, you know, he's interpreting the Constitution for the first time and all these things. He's the commander in chief. Uh, he assembles the militia and rides at the head of the militia to confront them on a white horse. I've often said that if we still had that tradition, we'd have far fewer wars that the president went first. Um, but the, the uh, whiskey rebels fold. And what Washington did was grant pardons to some of the leaders of the Whiskey Rebellion um, to, in the interest of national reconciliation, despite the fact that what they were charged with was murder. Mm -hmm. um, now, historically, we've seen it used in a variety of ways. We'll probably talk about that a little bit. But one thing that's significant and important is that we don't see a red-blue divide on this, that many of the places and the actors where we've seen clemency used most actively it's been uh, conservatives and Republicans. Uh, even Herbert Hoover, who's you know, viewed uh, negatively in a lot of ways, he granted over 1,200 commutation or clemencies in his uh, one term in office. And so we, it, this is not a liberal thing or a conservative thing. It is a human thing. You know, in, in your writing, you've suggested that the pardon power itself is a, is a critical part of living up to our deepest held values. Can, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, uh, I mean, it is, it, it comes from a place of mercy. And, um, you know, I know people come from many different faith traditions or where they draw their principles from. But when I talk to people about their deepest principles, mercy is almost always a part of it. Um, you know, in, in my own faith, tradition of Christianity. We just finished Holy Week. And right in the middle of Holy Week, we've got a clemency story where uh, Pilate puts um, Barabbas and Jesus in front of the crowd because there is that ancient Jewish tradition at, at the festival of, of releasing a prisoner. Um, and so this this deeply held principle is one of the few times that that um, people of many different faiths can see this principle at the center of their faith and people who, who draw their principles from outside of a faith tradition. And it's in the Constitution too, uh, right there at the center. And in, not just in the center of the federal Constitution, but the Constitution of states like Michigan. Sure. And, you know, I think in the context of the criminal law in particular, um, the, the criminal law isn't really set up to do mercy, you know, it's, it's this massive system. There, there's a lot of structure that's designed to bring regularity to it. And there's discretion on the part of prosecutors and judges, but ultimately the focus of the criminal legal system is, is on adjudication of guilt and on imposing, you know, the sentence prescribed by law. Um, you know, Alexander Hamilton said that criminal codes have an almost natural tendency towards over severity you know is is this why clemency is important to have in a system of government it, it is and the thing is that if there's one constant it's that things change people change and societies change and both of them make clemency important the fact that that people change over time uh we don't often have systems that that 
comprehensively take that under consideration. When I was a prosecutor in downtown Detroit and I finished a sentencing and the person was led away, once that door closed, that was the end of the case for me. And that was the, the way society views it. That was the end of that person's life, but it's not. And that's one part of it. The other part is that societies change. And sometimes we're incredibly retributive about something. Turns out it's a mistake or is something that was temporal, that was rooted in time. For example, in times of war, it's very important to make sure that people show up to serve in the army. And so we often have harsh sanctions for people who desert the army or uh, dodge the draft. And then after the war, we view that differently, that agency isn't there anymore. Um, and so what we're talking about today in terms of this being a, a current emergency that urges us to use clemency, that sense of time is something that's marked clemency from the beginning, that not all moments are equal, and sometimes it's the right time to use it. Absolutely. Um, so I'd like to go to Demetrius uh, a moment. Um, you know, Mark, Mark raised uh, two, I think, really critically important points, um, both that societies and societal values change and also that people change, and that, you know, in the context of a long sentence, um, a person's change can ultimately make that sentence unjust and, and a, a, a laudable target of mercy. Um, can you talk a little bit about your own experience um, with societal change, with personal change, and how that fits into the clemency process? Just one minute, I think we gotta unmute you. There you go. Can you hear me now? All right. Paul said that that was going to happen to someone. <laughs> um, well, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, I definitely agree with Mark. Um, everyone has a propensity to change. I always say we're not the sum of our mistakes. Um, and for instance, uh, with myself, um, I was sentenced to spend three natural life terms and a 10 to 20 consecutive um, during the war on drugs initiative as a first time offender. Um, so, uh, you know, during this time, there was uh, federal mandates that was in place. And because of these federal mandates, it circumvented uh, the decision of the judge. And therefore, I was sentenced to quite a bit of time. Um, but the thing is about it is we all, um, from being incarcerated for the 18 years, I've actually met many individuals who have had the time to do the hard work, who had the time to do the introspection, and, and they've made the changes necessary. And they continue working on themselves. Um, you know, basically, even with myself as a, a young man during that time, you know, I was one who actually recognized the fact that um, I needed to change. I needed to make uh, different choices in my life, which is a composite of so many men and women who are currently incarcerated. I work with our office at AFSC. We work with so many different individuals who I would stand up for bat for in a moment's time because these are individuals who've had the opportunity to change, to change the way they think, to change the way they understand. Therefore, you know, will be um, amazing um, contributors to society if only given the second chance. Um, you need to unmute. <laughs> Sorry, I'm unmuted. Um, work in progress, but one of the things things I think that's really striking about the war on drugs and drug laws is the ways in which society has evolved. You know, marijuana is legal in Michigan now. Um, the federal government passed the First Step Act um, the other year, resulted in a lot of reductions in sentences for people. Um, and we, we look at drug crime in very different ways than we did, you know, in the 80s, in the 90s, and just those societal changes, they, they have resulted in legislative um, reforms, but there's still people in prison who are sentenced under those old regimes that um, have sentences that look out of step now. Um, so I want to um, go to Paul. Um, Paul, I, you've been practicing law in Michigan for a, a long time. Um, is what are your observations about um, how often clemency is applied in Michigan and um, when it is applied and to whom? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I wanna start before answering your question, 
um, by correcting something you said in, in the introduction. Okay. Uh, you described me as an expert in criminal law and in uh, commutations, and both of those statements are false. Um, I'm actually a, a civil rights lawyer, uh, and my expertise is in prisoners' rights. Uh, I spent most of my litigation career uh, trying to get people uh, out of prison, uh, but I'm not a criminal defense lawyer. Uh, my experience on the commutation side arose uh, in 2011. At the very end of uh, Governor Granholm's term, uh, she had uh, she she was excellent at granting commutations. But at the very end of her term, she granted a, a commutation uh, on one of the last days of December before her uh, her term expired, uh, her second term expired, and. Um, there was great pushback from the victim's family in that case. And she got cold feet and decided to um, withdraw uh, or revoke the commutation. Uh, and as a civil rights lawyer, uh, uh, when I heard about this, it struck me that the governor has incredibly broad powers uh, when it comes to granting commutations uh, and other forms of clemency. Uh, but in my view, uh, once that event had occurred, uh, I didn't think the governor had the power uh, to take it back. Uh, the governor, there's nothing in the Constitution about uh, reimposing punishment uh, after the governor has uh, exercised clemency. Uh, I wound up uh, teaming up with former Michigan Supreme Court Justice Charles Levin. Uh, and the two of us filed a case to try to get that commutation reversed. Uh, it took uh, four years and a trip to the Michigan Supreme Court uh, to do it, but in the end, uh, we won a, uh, a unanimous opinion from the court that said, A, the power of the, government, of, of the governor can be reviewed by the courts, even though it's a very broad power. Uh, and the court agreed that uh, uh, the governor does not have the power to revoke uh, a completed executive act uh, like the granting uh, of clemency. Uh, we thought that meant that our client would then be immediately released. Uh, and once again, it turned out we were wrong. Uh, the parole board's position was all that the governor had done was change the sentence, making uh, our client no longer uh, someone serving mandatory life, life without parole, but had simply uh, changed his sentence to time served uh, to life. And the board therefore could uh, decide that they changed their minds and did not want to parole him. Uh, and uh, indeed that case too went uh, all the way to the Michigan Court of Appeals. We lost and the Michigan Supreme Court denied leave. And so it wasn't until that litigation ended uh, that the board finally relented uh, and our client was granted parole. Um, so my expertise is really in-depth in one case, uh, but I learned an immense amount from that case. Um, part of what I learned is directly pertinent to your question, and that is that some governors, uh, for whatever reason, simply aren't interested. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with the timing. If you're governor during a period of time when uh, culturally, we're being very, very tough on crime. Uh, it can be uh, against your political self-interest to uh, let people out. Uh, and as some politicians have found, if you let even one person out who recommits a, a, a widely uh, reported crime, uh, it can be extremely damaging. Uh, on the other hand, most people who are paroled uh, via commutation uh, do very well. They've been very carefully vetted. Uh, these are very, very worthy candidates. And it is exceedingly rare that someone who is commuted uh, winds up back in Britain. These, these are among the safest of the safe. Um, but governors do it based on their own uh, personality. I agree with what uh, Mark said. This is not a uh, red state, blue state sort of thing. It really is uh, the temperament of the government, of the governor, and the uh, of the political climate, I think, of the time. Uh, in my career, some of the uh, uh, liberal uh, democratic governors that you would have thought would have granted a lot of commutations didn't. Uh, 
uh, some Republican governors, uh, Sophie Williams back in the day, uh, was quite active with uh, commutations. Uh, in recent years, um, Governor Granholm was the one who really championed uh, the use of the power. Uh, in, in the end, we all know that mass incarceration is a huge drain on state resources. And we know that mass incarceration has very little to do with uh, crime rates. Uh, and so if, you've, if in the 80s, 90s, and uh, uh, the first decade of this century, if you put thousands and thousands of people into prison on very, very long sentences, uh, at some point, you're really going to start paying for it. Uh, and that's what happened. The Michigan uh, uh, Department of Corrections budget, uh, first it exceeded what we put into roads and infrastructure, then it exceeded what we put into education, and then it exceeded what we put into public welfare, and it remains the single largest uh, uh, financial drain on state resources. And so if you're serious about getting people out of prison who don't need to be there, even if you're only doing it not for mercy, but for financial reasons, uh, every place that you can make a dent in that population, you ought to be taking advantage of. And I think Governor Granholm understood that. She commuted more than 160 people, uh, including almost 40 uh, who were in prison on mandatory life sentences that is life without uh, Governor Snyder, uh, her successor, only commuted, uh, I believe it was around 25 people, and most of those uh, were not uh, people you'd think of as um, needing commutation. He commuted sentences for um, some business cronies, or what, you would, what could easily be viewed as business cronies, who had, you know, like drunk driving offenses and things like that, minor, minor things that were on their records. Uh, and then he also commuted uh, some sentences for in medical cases, but it was very, very little. Uh, Governor Whitman, Whitman we, we still don't know, right? She's uh, early in her term uh, and it remains to be seen. Uh, my own view is that uh, the COVID-19 crisis teaches us uh, that there ought to be ways to get people out of prison more easily uh, short of um, broad legislation. Uh, and so I, I'm hoping that if anything comes out of this webinar and this crisis, uh, it's a revisiting of uh, how commutation is used to make it easier in a crisis and frankly not in a crisis uh, for governors to get people out when it's appropriate. Yeah, I think that's really well said, Paul. And I, I, I want to just take a moment to um, talk about the ways in which the current system really constrains uh, the, gov the department's ability to act quickly. You know, as I said in my introduction, um, less than 15% of the general population is eligible for parole in Michigan. And that 15% is the only subset of the prison population that the Department of Corrections has any authority to release. The other 85%, is either not at their minimum sentence and therefore can't be um, considered for parole under the truth and sentencing law or they're serving a life term. And it really is just executive action is, is the way to get at that 85%. Um, we, do, we have heard just for the benefit of the group that um, the Department of Corrections is working to increase the pace of paroles for that the 15% they can parole and also is working, they're doing some administrative work to get people who are close to their outdates um, moved along by restoring, you know, forfeited sentencing credits and good time, that sort of thing. But it really is a small minority of the overall population that um, is even within the department's control. Um, the other aspect of the truth and sentencing law, I think um, it's important for folks to understand and we're, we're gonna do a panel on truth and sentencing, I think in the coming weeks as well, because it is so important. But it's, the rule is that you need to serve every day of your minimum sentence in quote unquote, a secure facility. And what that is defined to mean is a prison. You're within prison walls, within a locked gate and under 24 seven surveillance. Because of that, MDOC has a very limited ability to move people who are sick out of the system. They can't be hospitalized outside of the system without a grant of clemency, um, at least not on an inpatient basis. And also 
MDOC pays for every dollar of a prisoner's medical care until they're paroled. And that all comes out of our general fund. It's a $2 billion uh, corrections budget here in the state. And if they're caring for hundreds of sick people in COVID, it's, they're gonna burn through that $2 billion very quickly. Um, so I just wanted that to sort of be out there for the group so everybody understands um, um, what the dynamics that are happening within the system. Um, I'd like to go back to, um, to Mark a minute and, and take a step back um, and just talk a little bit about um, first, just as a general matter, how have governors and the president used their clemency power in the modern era? Has it been frequent? Has it happened throughout terms or at the end of terms? And uh, what kinds of people have been targeted for clemency? Sure. Um, just to start with what you mentioned at the end there, that you know, presidents and governors wait till the end of their term um, to use clemency. That is a very modern thing in the federal system. That really starts with uh, Clinton, with President Clinton. That before that, we saw it spread out over a president's terms. It's this is really important because it plays into what we're seeing in Michigan right now. What? is predictive of the number of grants is process more than anything else. That where there's a process that works to get the best people um, to the front of the line and have regular consideration by the executive, um, we, we see it working. Um, and where there's been a, an attempt um, to, to have a process that, that works that way, whether it's a red state, blue state, as I said before, we see that happening um, in Michigan. What and it, it, just to uh, offer another example in my my state here, we do a lot of things well in in Minnesota. Um, we have the second lowest incarceration rate in the country. We're terrible at clemency. Uh, to get clemency in the state of Minnesota, people have to personally appear in front of the governor, the attorney general, and the chief justice of the Supreme Court, plead their case directly to that panel almost always without a lawyer. And then they discuss it and decide on the fly right there. As you might imagine, it's hard to get those three together at any time. So it's a very narrow pipeline. So even though we have a progressive state in many ways, in the best sense, um, it does because we've got a bad process, it doesn't happen. Meanwhile, in South Carolina, um, you know, they grant hundreds a year mostly pardons, but the, it's because they've got a good process where they have a fairly diverse group that is meets regularly and makes decisions themselves, uh, the board does. Um, you know, in Michigan, you've got the problem of, of process that, um, you know, takes a while. And that means that in a, in a uh, situation like this, it's not agile enough to, to adjust um, and to, to take on what needs to be done. Just if I can mention one more thing too about this and regarding process is in the federal system, we've got a terrible process. It's got seven levels of review. It's mostly in, uh, ensconced in the Department of Justice, which is hopelessly conflicted since they sought the sentences in the first place. Um, and what we've seen is President Trump subverting that by just picking whoever without putting them through the process. Uh, and um, you know, that, uh, kind of goes to show how process can um, can be the problem, um, and and we certainly are seeing that in Michigan right now. Absolutely, and I, I'm I'm glad you brought up uh, Trump because you know there there have been a couple episodes um, recently that I've noticed uses of clemency power that have been extremely controversial. Mm -hmm. um, the first um, was Trump, who's been you know not using any discernible process and has been targeting people he's got relationships with um we've also got in kentucky governor bevin who you know has said and done good things on criminal justice issues he pardoned or i guess commuted and pardoned a number of sentences at the end of his term and there was a media firestorm about that mm -hmm. um, and i think they illustrate two kind of different constraints on um, executives' uh, willingness to get into this sort of discretionary grant of clemency pool. I, it, it seems to me that even though they have very, basically unchecked authority to grant these things, mm 
there, there's severe political constraints on the, the, the will of executives to actually use this authority. Yeah, it, it varies, of course. Um, you know, that, that what we've seen is that some presidents and governors have been very wary of using it at all. And some people pin this all the way back to George H.W. Bush and the Willie Horton ad. Uh, you know, now that involved a furlough, but the political calculus that um, was used, uh, you know, by, by Bush um, to gain election, that, that's a dynamic that we still see. Um, and so certainly the political considerations are something that I think have, have tempered what should have been done for a while. Um, you know, that said, look at, uh, look, at, look at what Trump did with the Alice Johnson uh, commutation. He let her out and then he paid $10 million or whatever for a Super Bowl ad that, that uh, celebrated that, that I used clemency to let this woman who was doing life on a serious narcotics charge out of prison. And so right now we're in a complicated time. The political dynamics are changing. And I think when you've got the Republican president using clemency as a campaign, you know, the grant of clemency as a campaign tool, that's an opening to uh, uh, leaving behind some of the timidity that we've seen by both Democrats and Republicans. And it's about time. Absolutely. And we, we've seen it from governors too, as a Oklahoma governor, right. obviously Kentucky. And those, you know, those are not progressive places or progressive governors we're talking about. I mean, it's, it's people that have governing very conservative states in very conservative ways, but I've seen clemency as a really valuable tool. Um, so I want to um, go to Demetrius and then, and then Paul. Um, so talking specifically about the commutation process in Michigan. Um, so Demetrius, could you um, tell us what your experience was with the commutation process? How long it took, sort of what steps were involved? Yeah, sure. Um, I'd, mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I'd be glad to. Okay. Um, now, the way that process happened when um, I filed, um, actually, if you all remember, um, in 2008, on February 1st, Governor Graham Holm in her state to state, she was talking about balancing uh, the state budget at the time. And one of the issues that she brought up was how she wanted a sweeping reform in the prison system, whereby she wanted to be more effective and more, you know, more effectively work. And so what happened is on February 16th of 2018, she um, executed an executive order 2007-2, uh, which established an executive clemency um, adversary council. And so what they begin to do at that point is they begin to um, actually look into individuals who they thought could, you know, go through the commutation process at that time, who could successfully transition back out into society. But for me, I was like the golden child of that, uh, of that case because um, what it was is I was a first time drug offender, never been in trouble. So I was like, you know, the hanging fruit at that time, the low hanging fruit at that time. So, you know, I fit the criteria perfectly. So in February, uh, uh, February 20th about uh, in 2008, I went on and submitted my commutation. Uh, I heard back from the parole board because here in Michigan, as you know, the process goes is the parole board is the gatekeepers to the commutation process. You have to go through the parole board first in order for it to go up to the governor. Um, so uh, on, I heard back um, July 25th from the um, parole board. They scheduled me a date, which was in August 28th for a public hearing. Um, once they, Once we had the public hearing, they in turn took those findings and they forwarded them up to the governor's office. And on February 13th uh, of 2009, um, the governor signed my release. Um, I did not receive the, my decision from the parole board until February, 23, uh, February 23rd of 2019. And I was released on May 19th. So uh, it took then about a year, three, a year to a year, a little over a year, a year, three months, four months for the whole process from the time I submitted my comp, uh, application to the time I was actually released. Um, however, that was rather quick. And that was only because the, of the six parole board members that were added, you know, in order to process it at the time. So, you know, that's why, you know, I personally feel that, you know, in order to do so, you know, 
we just have to make some changes. We have to streamline the commutation process. You know, we work a lot in our office with the commutation process, with, uh, with those who are drafting up their commutations. You know, we talk about the importance on having empathy when you're writing a computation, uh, commutation. It, we talk about having insight. We talk about accountability. Uh, we talk about all these issues in order to draft up the best commutation possible. Um, however, you know, you know, to streamline it, you know, like other states uh, have done. I, I heard Mark speak on this earlier, uh, uh, what other states have done. They just kind of don't have that, that uh, process with the parole board in place. It just goes straight to the governor. So, you know, I just think the best way in doing it is just to really streamline it, you know, as, as, as much as we possibly can. Absolutely. And uh, Paul, I, I just want to bring you in um, briefly to talk a little bit about what the statutory requirements are for yep. um, commutations, pardons, and reprieves. Those are all governed by a process that's laid out in uh, MCL 791.244. Could you talk a little bit about the timeline, what the process is? Sure. I, I, when I was uh, first involved in this and doing, doing the case, uh, I didn't have to know anything about the front end because we were coming in after the fact, right? It was the back end. Um, but, but reviewing this, the, uh, uh, the, the statutes, um, it, it is an ungainly process. Um, uh, the, the way it works is uh, the, the process can be started either by the prisoner uh, or, or an advocate for the prisoner filling out an application for commutation. Uh, or the board itself can take interest and put someone forward for a commutation. Uh, in either case, either from, from the date that the application is received or that the board has uh, begun uh, what they call the initiation process, um, they have to, within 60 days, uh, review the case uh, and determine that it has uh, sufficient merit uh, that they uh, may want to move forward. Um, uh, at that point, uh, there are some intermediate steps, but the, the intermediate steps don't run against the time deadlines. So from, it's, from, the, from the point of initiation or application, it's 60 days for a decision on merit to move forward. Uh, you then have to, uh, once you've made that decision, the board has to um, fairly quickly serve notice that they're intending to move forward, they're not making a decision, but to move forward, that has to go both to the, uh, the court uh, out of which the person was sentenced and the prosecutor in the county out of which the person was sentenced. Uh, from the same initiation beginning period, the board then has 270 days uh, the, the 60 are included in that, the first 60, but 270 days to decide whether or not to go forward uh, for a public hearing. Uh, and that means the board will have fully investigated the case. Uh, normally they'll have done uh, updated uh, medical and psychological reports. They'll have amassed all of the prisoner's file and reviewed it. Uh, and then they have to make the decision. And in Michigan, a uh, part of what makes the, the process cumbersome is that it's not just a panel of the board, but the full board has to decide to go forward. And so that takes uh, an executive uh, session and a majority of the board to vote. So you're 270 days out uh, in many cases, that's the maximum, but in many cases it takes that long uh, before you get to the public hearing. Uh, then the public hearing still has to be scheduled and there are notice requirements for it. The public hearing itself is, uh, uh, open to the public, as the name implies, uh, the, the victim, victim's family, if the victim uh, is deceased, uh, can appear, uh, they can oppose it, the press can appear, uh, and it's a long, drawn-out process. Um, so, this, so you're 360 days out before the hearing has to be conducted, uh, and then once the hearing is conducted, uh, the board uh, still has to make a decision in executive in an executive session, and then that decision has to be sent to the governor. So it's a 360-day period. So it means just uh, to be within the statute, it's going to be at least a year, and that's not counting the board making the decision at the back end, getting it to the governor, and then the governor uh, thinking about it right, and making the governor's decision. 
so, so that's a long haul. And then uh, as Demetrius pointed out, even if you get the commutation, what that is doing is uh, triggering the parole order in most cases. Uh, the, the one uh, exception is uh, the case I handled where the board said no afterwards, uh, exceedingly rare. Um, but then parole itself can take three or four months. So yeah, this is a process that's going to be uh, in the normal course uh, upwards of a year and probably a year and three or four months. Uh, as I recall, the average time from um, approval of the, the signing of the computation to release uh, was about three months. There were some that took longer and some that were quicker, uh, but that was probably the average. Um, you, you had mentioned earlier that the um, that only about 15% of uh, Michigan prisoners are parole eligible. And, and I wanted to put a plug in for the board. I and mean, part of that is because uh, the, the current board is really making an effort uh, to get people out as close to their earliest release date as possible. Uh, and when a board does that, um, you're, you're, you're <clears throat> reducing the total number of time, the cumulative number of, amount of time uh, that all prisoners serve. And uh, if you're able to do that, it makes a big difference. Uh, what you have to do, of course, is get people into that pipeline even before their earliest release date so that you're, you're making the decision at the earliest possible time. And that way the worthy candidates are walking uh, at the earliest possible time. Absolutely. And I, I wanna go back to Demetrius here just uh, for a minute to start uh, setting the stage for a discussion about um, the pandemic and, and what could p potentially be done. Um, so Demetrius, when um, you were going through the process, there was an executive clemency board. Um, the parole board was 15 members. Um, what has changed since then? Well, um, unfortunately, what has changed since then is they do not have that board, uh, those extra members anymore. So it's back to uh, the re uh, regular amount of board members. Um, so it does make the process a lot lo slower. Um, right now, we just need some robust, robust means in order to get these things, get these um, commutations processed as quickly as possible. Um, with the pandemic, as you mentioned earlier, uh, we are, I'm personally um, at AFSC, we're personally in contact with uh, individuals who are incarcerated on a daily basis. And um, with over 400 now cases and 11 deaths, um, something has to be done quickly. Um, we're hearing word that, you know, just there's so much tension that is currently, um, that currently exists in um, all the prisons throughout Michigan. Um, so something has to be done because, you know, right now, I mean, back when Jennifer Graham did um, execute that order, you know, only, I would say 162, if I'm not mistaken, was actually released during that time. Um, you know, which at that time considerably was a drop in the bucket of what was actually um, going on uh, in the system at that time. However, uh, we just feel that right now, if we can just put more pressure on the governor, as well as Michigan Department of Corrections in order to, you know, put the commutation on a more fast pace to get individuals out. I mean, even if it is, you know, um, creating a, uh, a more, board, uh, more board members, however, I think that that will be too long to do. Um, personally. Uh, so I just think that just putting more and more pressure upon the uh, governor to just make an executive order uh, by which more and more that they can truly streamline the commutation process. Hey, John, if I can jump in here. Um, one thing to note is that the Michigan statute uh, does allow for that. Um, 791.244a says that upon a request from the governor, under this section to expedite the review and hearing process for a reprieve commutation or pardon based in part on a prisoner's medical condition, then the, it, there can be an acceleration of the process. And it certainly seems like if nothing else, the governor needs to kick that in because the medical conditions of the most vulnerable are part of what plays into this. Absolutely. And that, that's a, I think a great segue into the, the next section. Um, I'm, I'll talk a little bit about emergency powers um, as well, just because I, I know we've gotten some questions about that and that does play into what the governor could do. Um, so the thing um, that's um, 
most important to understand about the governor's emergency powers is that um, the governor has the ability to suspend a regulatory statute, order, or rule prescribing the procedures for the conduct of state business when strict compliance with that statute, order, or rule would prevent, hinder, or delay necessary action in coping with the disaster emergency. That's a direct quote from the Michigan Code. It's um, MCL 30.4051A. Um, that's one of the sections that has been the basis for a number of the executive orders that have come out uh, since the crisis. But um, you know, given that the crisis is a public health emergency and we have this cumbersome commutation process with lots of timelets and that sort of thing, it, it seems to me at least um, that that authority provides um, the ability for the governor to modify or streamline either the commutation process or um, the medical parole or another um, another uh, statutory means for releasing people um, in, in a much uh, faster way than is currently prescribed. Um, so, you know, like we've talked a little bit about the way the commutation process in Michigan looks, and I'm, I'm gonna go to you, Mark, and just ask, what are some of the things that you think Michigan should do, um, given what the process is, um, to um, improve its commutation process in the pandemic? And I'll, I'll ask uh, later for sort of general reforms. Yeah, I, I think, um, John, the, the major thing is that the, the uh, citation you just gave to the emergency powers that allow, um, you know, rules to, to um, basically be amended on the fly in an emergency, that, that would be the way to go, and that's the way the governor should go. That, that here, um, in terms of process, what they need is a small, nimble, expeditious group that's focused just on this. Uh, you know, you could... Um, you know, have a, have a group even of, of, you know, five to nine, it could be on the parole board, it could be outside of the parole board. Um, and it may make sense to have it be outside of the parole board, because that way you could bring in a medical expert, for example, um, or medical experts, um, people who are able to identify quickly within the prisons, um, you know, who's most vulnerable, and which prisons would benefit the most. And one thing to remember is that What's important now, as much as we talk about Lakeland and, and how there already is the disaster there, um, in the prisons where we don't have that level of infection yet, that may be where it's most important to identify the, the people we can get out and just in the population before that hits. I mean, we're looking at a pandemic that's going to be a rolling disaster over the next year or so. And so, you know, we're, this is beyond looking back at what we can do, looking forward at what must be done right now, I think using uh, the emergency powers that the governor has to form a, um, you know, basically you're talking about an elite squad that's able to take the medical and legal considerations and the situation on the ground um, in the prisons into account, thin the population quickly, uh, get people into quarantine and, um, you know, avoid death penalties in Michigan effectively. Yeah. I'd like to go to Demetrius next. I, you know, this isn't something we've touched on directly, Demetrius, but you, could you talk a little bit about why it is very challenging to social distance inside a prison and um, why even if the facility doesn't have infections currently, why it's smart to take proactive measures to um, uh, thin population and permit people to um, do a better, um, do more social distancing. Well, um, I think one of the biggest issues uh, in Michigan Department of Corrections, when you're talking about social distancing, one of the biggest issues that we're we're hearing is the fact that um, pretty much uh, men and women who are incarcerated, they don't trust the system. And when it comes down to them not trusting the system, what happens in a lot of cases is what we're hearing is when someone is sick and they are showing signs, they don't want to report it. And the reason why they don't want to report it is because they're not trusting the system. And it's because of the fact that right now what Michigan Department of Corrections is actually doing is when someone is actually sick, sick or showing symptoms, they immediately quarantine these individuals without any of their property, without any of their belongings. And so these individuals don't want to uh, have to face that. 
So that's been an ongoing issue. We, we've been hearing a lot about that. And um, to be perfectly honest with you, when it comes to social distancing, it just cannot be done with the current, current system, with how Michigan Department of Corrections is set up. It, it, it just can't. It's, it's impossible. Um, you're always in a cell with an individual. Um, you know, I know that they have some protocols in place in which they're doing their very best um, in order to try to keep social distancing around. But then now it's putting a strain on individuals who are incarcerated because we're hearing that in some institutions, um, because they're only letting one wing out at a time to go to dinner, to go to lunch, to go to uh, breakfast, you know, some individuals aren't getting out to um, eat dinner until after 10 o'clock at night. Um, so it, it's, it's extremely challenging when you think about it on those um, ideals because of the fact that, you know, um, unfortunately, you know, in, you have officers who are continually coming in and, you know, when by their continue coming in, we don't know their exposure and what's happening with them. And as they're coming in now, I do know that from what I'm understanding that they are testing the officers before they come in, but um, it has been shown that some people are carriers of it and not showing any signs. You know, so when you're in and, you know, it's like a Petri dish, you know, when you're talking about in the system, uh, because of the fact that, you know, you are always in the same areas continually, you know, and so it's just, it's when it comes to social distancing, it just cannot be done, you know, uh, in the prison, in, um, in the prison setting. Thank you, Demetrius. That's, that's really helpful. Uh, one other point, I, I, I think is important to make in this context, and I'll, I'll throw it back at you is, you know, and, and you raised this, but it's, you know, it's not just an issue for the prison population, it's for the surrounding communities. I mean, many of these prisons are in rural areas um, that may not have a lot of infection, but um, it's, these are tight knit communities where a lot of the employment is within the prison. And um, it seems to me that there'd be a real risk of an outbreak spreading from the prison. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I mean, um, they are giving the, uh, the prisoners masks. They are receiving masks. Um, uh, and we've talked to um, individuals who actually work, um, you know, work at the facilities in order who are making the mask. And they're saying they've been working six days a week, 12 hours a day, you know, to make enough masks for everybody who is currently incarcerated. So, you know, that brings another, you know, situation that's transpiring in the, uh, in the prison system where, you know, you have individuals who are working, working tirelessly in order to make sure that everyone in the system actually have masks. Yeah, we're, we're glad to see um, the, the heightened uh, measures, but just given the physical layout of, of these facilities, you know, it's, it's still a, a very dangerous environment. Um, want to give Paul the opportunity to um, add to what uh, Mark and Demetrius have, have said about um, what the, the governor's office should look at um, in terms of uh, emergency measures or um, measures to manage the pandemic inside the system. Um, well, anything to add, Paul? Well, I mean, just uh, the, the first point to be made is that the, um, the relatively new provision that permits medical clemency uh, clearly was not designed uh, with COVID-19 uh, in mind. Uh, this is not an emergency procedure um, or process. Uh, I, I said before that it's basically 360 days from uh, initiation to uh, a finished hearing under the normal process, under the medical clemency process, it's a little bit accelerated. Uh, it, it's, it's accelerated at the front end. Instead of 60 days, the board has 10 days to review and, and then to make the decision on merit for moving forward. Um, but it's the same 30-day process to inform the prosecutor in the court. Um, instead of 270 days out uh, for making the decision on whether or not to hold a public hearing, it's 90 days, uh, but then uh, by the time the public hearing is conducted, uh, it's 180 days. And so, yes, it's roughly half of what the regular process is, but if it's 180 days and then you still have to get the person paroled uh, and you may or may not be, be able to hold a public hearing, you know, during a crisis of this sort, uh, it, it, this is not an accelerated process uh, that's called for when there's a pandemic. Um, uh, the, the question is to uh, the, the extent of the, 
uh, governor's executive powers uh, is, uh, I think, different in every state, in part depending on uh, what the constitutional authority of the governor is. And in Michigan, it's um, murky. There's been very little litigation uh, on these kinds of issues. Um, but it is true that the current version of the Constitution that grants the power to the government to the governor um, has changed over time. In 1850, uh, the only thing that limited the governor's power uh, were regulations uh, as to the manner of applying for the clemency. Uh, and so it was just the application itself that could be uh, regulated um, by the legislature. The current version of the uh, Constitution says that the power is subject to procedures and regulations prescribed by law. Uh, and uh, uh, it's certainly clear that the law that we've got right now uh, it isn't going to be up to what's necessary to deal with the pandemic. Uh, and so I think, yes, we're, we have to rely on, uh, on the governor uh, to act in her under the Emergencies uh, Powers Act. Uh, and th that would be the only uh, way that we can make a difference now, uh, in my view. Yeah, that, that, that's my view as well. Um, it's just the, the process as it exists now is just so drawn out, it's so resource intensive. And ultimately you're talking about, you know, 15 months for a, a single person, you know, as, as was the case with Demetrius, you know, it's to effectively thin the population in facilities, we're talking about hundreds of people really need to be released. Yeah, it does work. I mean, there is one other statute that allows the board to act uh, that was also passed recently that allows for medical paroles. Um, and it isn't clear on the face of that whether that includes people who are pre-ERD, who are, who are still before their earliest release date. But probably the best reading is, is that, no, it's only people who are actually within the board's jurisdiction already, uh, but whom the board has decided they don't want to parole. Um, and but now for medical reasons or who don't meet the requirements for parole, but now the board could decide to let them out. Um, but but even that also is an ungainly process and it has fairly tight definitions of what it means to be medically frail. Uh, and if you're medically frail, yes, you can get out, but you might be totally healthy and the risk you're facing is the virus. Uh, and that may or may not meet the definition of medical frailty. You know. Uh, this is this is if we had a different commutation setup or we didn't have any restrictions at all um, the opportunity for the governor uh, in a state with a, with a broader power uh, would be uh, terrific the, the, the governor could really step in and make a difference uh, here the governor has to decide if it's within her power uh, and then exercise it if it is right um, okay so we're, we're past one o'clock and i just want to um give each of the panelists an opportunity to sort of say, okay, when the COVID crisis is over, what are some of the things that we as a state should look to do to improve our clemency process and make it more effective for the next time something like this happens? Um, or, you know, simply just make it a more effective process where more people see their sentences commuted. I mean, we, we have, um, by some measures, the longest average length of stay in the country in our state prison system, and some sort of mechanism needs to be introduced to mitigate the harshness of the, the existing system. Um, and then when we've got statements from everyone on that, I'm going to go to questions. I know we've got a bunch of questions, and I want to make sure there's time uh, to answer at least some of them. So uh, let's start with Mark, sort of, you know, big picture, what should Michigan look to do with its clemency process? going forward when we're out of this emergency situation. Yeah, I think one thing um, I mentioned earlier is that crisis uh, brings out the strengths and weaknesses of a society. And, and this is bringing out our over-incarceration and the problem that that presents. And so the, the imperative um, to lessen incarceration is, is going to be even clearer after this. And, and here's something else that's going to happen is that um, we have clemencies in places like Oklahoma that, that are relatively unprecedented. They've been driven by COVID-19. I think we're going to see more and more of that. 
And what that's going to allow us to do is to measure success that those people who are let out suddenly and, and perhaps with not, without all the process that previously adhered to this, do we end up with a recidivism rate that is um, the same or less than we saw of people who did their full term? Now, based on everything that we've seen in the past, for example, the Sentencing Commission has done studies of when they reduced sentences for crack. Um, I suspect what we're gonna see is no higher recidivism rate than people who did the full term. And what that tells us is that it won't imperil public safety to grant more commutations. Um, and that is, that is an important part of the picture politically. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind when we come out the other side of this is to measure results, to look at public safety. And I think in the end, that's gonna really strengthen the argument for using clemency more vigorously um, by governors and by the president. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I want to go to um, Demetrius next. Um, what sort of reforms would you like to see in our clemency process going forward? All right, I would definitely have to agree with Mark on that. Um, if you know the idea of public safety, if, if if that's what we're actually considering here, then there are many individuals who um, can be effectively transitioned out through the commutation process. Um, let me give you a, 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 an example. Uh, there's a gentleman that I'm currently working with who was um, incarcerated, and he has now been in the system for over 30 years. Um, he was sentenced at the age of 18 years old. There was a crime that was committed. Uh, his two co-defendants, although he was not the shooter, his two co-defendants were 17 years old. Uh, both of the, his co-defendants have been released, uh, but yet he is still in the system because of the fact that he was just a bit older than his co-defendants. He just crossed that threshold of being 18 years old. Um, so when you're looking at cases like this, and I could, we can talk about 100, our, our office deals with so many different cases that are simulated. These are individuals who can actually be transitioned back out into society. Um, these are individuals who have something to offer um, us in society. And I think what we need to do is I think that we need to get out and um, educate the public on exactly what's happening in the system. We need to get out and we need to get more progressive prosecutors. We need to make sure that we're utilizing our power in voting to get people into positions who are able to make uh, sound decisions when it comes to um, these long um, and exasperated um, incarcerations. So um, for me, I would think, I would say that just, you know, bringing an awareness um, out here to the public on um, the fact that there are so many individuals who are currently in prison who, if given the second chance, they would thrive. And not only thrive, that, but I, they would add so much to our community. They would enrich in our community because of what they have learned through their incarceration, because of what they have developed. And we can learn from these individuals. Um, a case in point, uh, out of the 162 that Jennifer Graham home um, released, I think only one is actually back in the system and he was back on a violation. You know, so it, it works. It works. And I just think we need to articulate that message to our public to let them know that, you know, commutations do work. Hey, thank you, Demetrius. Very well said. And uh, Paul, we'll give you the last word on uh, potential reforms to the process before we go to the questions. Um, and I will, I will kick it off um, when you're done. I mean, my view is this isn't rocket science. You know, we are um, over incarcerating people in this country. If you look at all other Western nations, um, people, more people spend more time in our prisons by far than any other uh, Western civilized country. Um, in our lifetimes, uh, the, the, the time that people serve for the same crimes uh, has more than doubled. Uh, when I was first practicing, I, I sued the board uh, endlessly and deposed virtually every member of the board. And um, people in on a first offense, but a serious one, like murder two or CSC one, um, the, the, the normal sentence was around 18 years. Um, uh, when we, uh, by ballot initiative, made it so that sentences had to be served first 80% of the minimum and then 100% of the minimum, uh, it's not as if judges adjusted the sentences and said, well, this is going to change things. 
yes, people need to be in maybe a little longer. That's what the public wants. But no, it doubled the sentences because we took away all good time and all other credits. And a 25-year sentence went from being 12 and a half years to 25 years. And if you're doing that, uh, you're over-correcting. Uh, so my view is that uh, what's going on with commutations is just uh, a, a subpart, really, of uh, criminal justice reform. Uh, we know that we're uh, overpaying for incarceration and getting very little at the back end for it. And the longer people are in and the more people are in, uh, the more we're not only paying for the cost of the incarceration itself, but also for their health care. Uh, and, and the budget just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, uh, again, to the board's credit uh, and to some of the admi recent administration's credit, uh, the Michigan has done a good job at reducing its population to the extent that it can. Uh, it's uh, many thousands lower than it was 10 years ago, uh, but there's a long, long way to go. Uh, I, I agree with Demetrius, you need, and Mark, uh, you need a process, you need a pipeline so that at any given time, there's a host of people who are moving through the system towards the governor's office. And that way, uh, these are people who are carefully vetted. Uh, the process works. Uh, we know that the results are fantastic. It, it's extraordinary uh, how few people return, microscopic. Uh, and uh, that's a working system. Uh, we're not gonna have a constitutional convention that amends the governor's powers. Uh, everybody's always afraid of constitutional conventions. You know, you, you might regret what you ask for and you'll wind up with a new constitution that in lots of ways is uh, less useful than the one you had. Um, but there's all kinds of legislative fixes that can be made, uh, including to the, to the process here. Some the governor can do on her own, adding new members to the board or adding an executive committee that uh, looks for the best candidates. Uh, but the process itself could be amended legislatively uh, this is a very, very old process. Um, it probably goes back to before there even was parole, when uh, all life sentences in Michigan were mandatory life. They were all life without parole. Uh, and there's no reason that it has to be as cumbersome as it is. Uh, I think those are the recommendations. It's common sense. Uh, if you're going to reduce the population, you have to shorten sentences at the front end, and you have to have uh, better parole options at the back end and leave it to the professionals, the members of the board, to decide uh, uh, who really needs to be in prison for these you know, incredibly long sentences, uh, and who, as soon as they pass their minimum, uh, is good to go. Well, thanks a lot, Paul. And I, I, I want to thank all of our panelists here um, for their insights and for participating. Uh, I'm going to go to questions now, and I, I just have a couple I want to run through quickly. Um, uh, first, uh, we have a question, just what does it mean to become parole eligible? So in Michigan, there's two ways to do that. Uh, either you've served, you're you serving a term of years and you serve your minimum sentence, that, that gets you into the parole board's jurisdiction, or you're serving a parolable life sentence, and you're either eligible at 15 or 17 and a half years, depending what, what your underlying crime was. Um, so the vast majority of people just are serving a term of years and haven't served their minimum. But there is another, you know, set of maybe a thousand people that are serving parole eligible life sentences um, that could be uh, paroled as part of this effort. Um, we got a, a number of questions just sort of about um, what is being done to brief the governor's office on these issues. And so I, I can speak for Safe and Just Michigan and some of the partner organizations that we're working with. Um, first, we submitted recommendations to this governor's transition team before she was even in office. And those included uh, creating an executive clemency board and expanding the parole board to 15 members, basically restoring the, the status quo from the end of the Granholm administration when they were doing a lot more proactive work to get people into the, the pipeline. Um, and we've since followed up with similar recommendations with her policy and legal staff. Um, a number of organizations have made um, recommendations to the governor's legal staff, which uh, my understanding is that it's the legal staff that's vetting and writing the executive orders 
Um, we've co-signed a number of letters, um, proposed executive orders and the like that have gone out. Um, but we haven't really gotten any sense of what's under consideration at this point. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's hard to say whether um, the streamlining of the commutation authority that we've discussed here is, is likely to happen. Um, obviously, there's political risks to doing that. And, um, you know, the governor's going to be weighing those risks against the benefits of uh, taking more aggressive action. Um, okay, so let me see if I can pick out some uh, quick ones for the panel. Um, just, uh, Paul, we got a question. Um, can the governor reduce a sentence from life without parole to a term of years? Um, yes, that's exactly what the commutation does. Right. Uh, when you read the commutation, it says uh, your life sentence is commuted to uh, and it gives the date that the uh, commutation was signed, or actually uh, it's commuted to the date that the board approved you for the commutation, and it's that term to life. So it means if you uh, wind up, now that you're parolable, if you then go out on parole and screw up, uh, when you come back in, you're coming back in on your life sentence. Um, but yes, that's exactly what a commutation does. Okay. And just, we got a similar question, just, um... Are people who have not, um, who are not parole eligible, are they eligible for commutation without any sort of other actions? Uh, yes, uh, any, anyone is eligible for commutation, whether you're uh, on a, uh, a life without parole sentence or a, an indeterminate term of year sentence, if you have not yet reached your minimum, your earliest release date. Um, the, uh, I believe under the rules, for the prisoners, uh, you can only apply once every two years. Uh, and so uh, there's, there's that uh, limitation as well. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Paul, because I, I, I'm going to ask Demetrius this question. Um, but um, we've gotten a few questions from people whose uh, loved ones have pending applications. I think there's uh, a number that are uh, held over from the Snyder administration. Um, Demetrius, do you have recommendations to people that have pending? applications? Well, from what our office understanding, those that were held over from the Snyder um, administration have been answered, um, last that we did here. Um, but our recommendations is this, if, um, for instance, if you have any questions in regards towards how the process is working, um, any insights in regards towards your draft, you can always reach out to the American Friends Service Committee. Uh, we'll be happy to go over your conversation. We'll be happy to go over the conversations, look at the language, uh, you know, and, and, and give you our um, input and insight uh, in regards towards what makes a strong commutation request. Um, as far as waiting goes, um, <laughs> It's just it's just a waiting process right now there you know you're in that that hold zone with michigan department of corrections because honestly no one knows what's actually going on with the governor what choices she's gonna make what decisions she's gonna make so it's like they're in a holding pattern right now until um you know she actually reaches out to the parole board and you know lets them know you know exactly what's going to happen and what she wants to do with it um so if there is any questions in regards towards it, uh, you could definitely reach out to American Friends Service Committee and uh, we would be happy to help you as a mini, any way we possibly can. Hey, thank you, Demetrius, really appreciate that. We got a couple uh, questions just on the specifics. Like, are, are there sort of kinds of arguments that you guys recommend people make in their commutation applications? And just what are the mechanics of applying? I, I think there's a form that's on the Department of Corrections website, right? Instructions. Yeah, I, I can speak, I can't speak to, you know, Michigan's process specifically. Uh, I saw a question that said, you know, there's only a paragraph in the, the form. Um, you know, that's not enough if I'm, I've done you know, decades to explain my rehabilitation. Of course it's not. And, and uh, hopefully in Michigan, like every other uh, jurisdiction I've worked in, you can say see attached and have a, a fuller um, description of what you've done. Um, now I, I've talked to a lot of decision makers in the field of clemency and I can tell you that some of the things that that they are looking for is uh, overall what you have to convince them is that there's been a, a change in your life <laughs> that uh, there's a turning point 
um, and that that there's safety and you're going to be a good citizen. Um, things to avoid, and this is this is something that is the biggest pitfall of people applying for clemency, is denying responsibility. This isn't the innocence project. This is the guilty project. And part of what you have to do, and now some people are innocent and there's avenues to pursue that. Clemency usually isn't the way that's pursued. Um, and so accepting responsibility for the underlying crime is, is really essential. Um, beyond that, uh, you know, describing the change in, in the person's life, a rehabilitation is important. And then the third part is having a concrete uh, description of what reentry will be like. What are you going home to? What are you going to do? What is your job going to be? Where are you going to live? The more specificity you can offer, the stronger the, the petition is going to be. Thank you for bringing that last point up, uh, Mark. It, it's really important. And, and um, it, it's, it's something that is really critical to the parole process in Michigan as well. You know, we've, we've um, talked to a lot of people who have parole eligible loved ones and it's, you know, the reason that it can take months for someone to be released, even on parole, is the department is extremely concerned with the practical logistics, where a person's going to be living, you know, can they get a job, you know, who's living in the place um, where they plan to live. Th those are things that, uh, even for paroles, the department's going to want to see worked out in advance, and the more um, folks can do to to put together a really um, persuasive parole plan, the better, because that, that helps the department do, do what they need to do. Um, yeah, I, I, I would add to this, um, you know, the commutation process is sort of parole on steroids, um, because not only do you need, uh, you know, a well done, uh, carefully documented application, but if you're successful with the application and get the public hearing, uh, the public hearing is uh, quite unlike uh, a normal parole hearing. You're in front of uh, board members, uh, but the victim or the victim's family are in the room. Uh, it's a long slog. Uh, you will be cross-examined at length about the details of the crime uh, and uh, everything you've done in your life since. Um, in, I've been to many, many public hearings and invariably, when the, uh, when the candidate is asked, you know, why should the, the board let them out, uh, the first words out of the candidate's mouth uh, are, I'm a changed man, right? And the board's reaction is always the same. They say, everybody says that. You need to tell us how that change occurred. They want to hear of the, the insight that you have uh, about what got you off track in the first place, and led you to the place that you're, uh, to the point where you wound up uh, committing a violent crime and being incarcerated, and then your progress since. It's um, looking very savvy people in the eye and making them understand uh, that when you say, I'm a changed man, you can back it up. Uh, that's, that's what matters. And, and when gets the application. I, I should say, 80% of the people who make it, more than 80% of the people who make it to a public hearing uh, wind up parole. Uh, and the statistics are probably um, about the same, maybe a little lower on commutation cases, but then you still have to get the governor per, uh, to be persuaded. But the last thing I should say is, it also takes a governor's office that has um, created a process within the office to make this a priority. Um, you don't expect that to be a priority uh, in the first six months of a new governor's administration, right? Uh, governors are thinking this will be end of the year or end of the next year or whatever. Uh, but you need people in the office who are reviewing cases, who are letting the parole board know, um, get us cases. We're, we're going to start working on this. But, but it means dedicated people whose job, uh, a big part of their job, is to review these cases and invite the cases uh, and vet the cases and make recommendations to the governor. Yeah, and that's a really great point, Paul. I, it's something I, I want to just expand on briefly, because I think one of the reasons we did not see a lot of commutations under the Snyder administration and haven't seen any under the current administration is a lack of resources and a lack of focus within the governor's office on getting people into the pipeline. Um, just anecdotal experience, but, you know, there's 
a lot of pending applications that were held over and it uh, I guess Demetrius you said they've worked through those now but um, you know a lot of applications are put in and not very many end up in public hearing and um, I think part of that is because just there's not the dedicated resources to, to do those things. Um, I had one question I wanted to uh, to flag just this is uh, uh, from uh, from Marla at the Innocence Project at Cooley. Um, just, uh, you know, she's said what about her clients who are um, maintaining innocence? And that is a really tricky issue. We see it with paroles as well as commutations, but um, our experience is for both parole consideration and commutations, uh, an innocence claim is, is not typically received favorably. Um, and I just, it's too bad. I mean, I, I've heard of instances where, you know, a, a commutation is granted because of doubt about the underlying guilt or um, process, but that's not typically the way I think the, the governor's office or the parole board is approaching these cases. Um, and then just um, finally, I, I think we're, we're close to wrapping up. Um, there has been a lot of really good resources that have been shared in the chat and I want to make sure everyone is has looked at those. Um, in particular, uh, AFSC and Humanity for Prisoners are offering services and support to people that might need assistance with commutations and you know we recommend uh, both organizations highly for that purpose. Uh, they do great work. Um, and there's been statutory citations and other commentary on the conversation here that um, I, I think is worth checking out. So um, with that, I want to give um, uh, each panelist the opportunity for parting words and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, let, let's start with Mark. Sure. I, I, I want to speak to something. There's a lot of advocates on, on uh, the chat, I can tell. And you may wonder why as a prosecutor I end up doing this work. Um, it's because a lot of federal defenders made futile speeches when I was at a sentencing. And they knew it was futile. There were mandatory sentences. A lot of them were crack. Um, it wasn't going to change what happened, but it changed me. And, uh, you know, I've gone on to really work hard on some of these things, uh, um, both on, you know, the crack powder ratio and now on clemency. Um, so when you feel like you're making futile speeches, you don't know who's listening and your work is important and it all adds up and it's creating a critical mass that really is going to change things. Hey, thank you, Mark. And thank you for joining us. We'll go to Demetrius next. Well, you know, mine is based on my experience. And, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, um, throughout my time of incarceration, as well as my work the last five years with the American Friends Service Committee, you know, I've come to uh, run into some amazing advocates. Um, I've come to experience some individuals um, who uh, are currently incarcerated, who are just, you know, individuals who have done the necessary work to change you know, who have really committed to, um, you know, rethinking and who really committed themselves to saying, you know, doing what is needed in order to be the person, be the productive person um, that they have become. Um, so when it, when it comes to that, I just think uh, personally, there are just, again, I can't reiterate enough on the fact that there are just so many individuals who are currently incarcerated, who if given that second chance, will do some amazing things in our community. Um, so for me, I just think that, you know, it is vital for us in the recognition of this, the recognition of the fact that these aren't just, you know, individuals who are just to be thrown away, but these are individuals who have made some mistakes and made some horrific mistakes. However, they've learned from their mistakes and because they have learned from their mistakes, then they're deserving of a second chance. Okay. Well said, Demetrius, and thank you for participating. It's really great to have you here. Um, and we'll give Paul the last word. I'm going to be getting up and walking to another room because I think my wife needs the office, but... <laughs> one, of, one of the um, eccentricities of working from home. I, I always think it's interesting how we, you know, get where we are. Um, I, it's not as if I started my career as a lawyer thinking, oh, I want to be a prisoner's rights lawyer. Um, I wound up working in a civil legal aid office in Jackson, Michigan, which at the time uh, had the largest walled prison in the Western world. Uh, and I wound up spending time in the prison, getting to know people and saw the incredible need for uh, 
uh, for strong lawyering uh, within the walls. Um, I, I think uh, at the present moment, there's a better chance of um, serious criminal justice reform uh, in this country and in this state than there has been at any time in my life. And my view is um, change doesn't come by legal cases and decisions and change doesn't come uh, simply by some cultural change in the or chemistry in the in the culture. Um, it, it, it's everything, every little thing matters. And we've got an opportunity now in the next year and in the next five years maybe um, to really make a change, to undo some of the damage that occurred uh, in the uh, the last three decades when we uh, when the, the mass incarceration movement took hold. Uh, and what I want to say to everybody is don't waste it. Uh, we need advocates, we need um, uh, in every area people have to be outspoken and um, just tireless in the work. But it can be done. Uh, I believe it can be done. And if not now, when? Hey, that's a great note to, cl to close on. Uh, thanks so much, Paul. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Josh, who's gonna uh, take us out. Safe and Just Michigan, the AFSC Michigan Criminal Justice Program, thank you for participating in today's events. Please do us a favor and fill out the, and answer our exit survey. The links were in the chat room and also on the main screen. We'll be hosting several upcoming webinars, including one on truth and sentencing and another on the problem of carve-outs for violent crimes. We'll be uh, advertising those soon. On the screen, we have included several ways that you can keep in contact with Safe and Just Michigan. Thanks again for participating in today's panel. Have a great day.